So everyone, welcome. It's Wednesday at noon here at One Schoolhouse, and that means we've got a webinar for you on what's going on. I'm excited to welcome Alex Panchowski this, uh, this time. Um, we are super excited about our topic. He and I have been talking for years about this one. Tech saved us, tech let us down. This is an ongoing conversation that we have been having. Um, if you're not into EdTech Chat on Twitter on uh, Monday nights at eight, you can join us there too. So on our blog this week, we have the Owls Have Flown the Nest, and that one is written by me, actually, Sarah Hanewald, at, here at One School House, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs. And then next week's webinar is going to talk about this upcoming summer and how we can fill our buckets. So a little beach analogy there. So Advanced Independent Curriculum has been released. We are really excited about our Advanced Independent Curriculum and the opportunities that it presents for schools to think about how do we offer advanced courses that help us really live our mission and values as a school. And we've got some professional development for schools who are ready to jump in and think about Advanced Independent Curriculum and what that might look like at their schools. We've also got some professional development this summer called Reflect, Restore, and Renew. And we've got this for teachers and leaders as we think about entering school in September 2021 and getting ready for that year. We know we don't wanna go back to what September 2019 was like. Um, we might look back on that right now with some nostalgia, but there's a lot that we were concerned about then and how are we gonna move forward into the next version of normal, not the old normal, but the next normal. And what does that look like? And then I'm going to start us off with the results of a poll. And Alex, I shared this with you just moments before. So this is totally unfair, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment. So we asked the question, what had the biggest impact on professional, on your your outcome? Was it professional development? Was it new software? Was it new hardware? And what I love is that the answer is, as it so often is in tech, well, it depends. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and welcome Alex. And Alex, can you just tell everyone a little bit about you and your career to get us started? Sure. I am currently the Director of Educational and Information Technology at North Broward Preparatory School in Coconut Creek, Florida. I've been here uh, since July of 2019. So I arrived six months before the pandemic happened to a new job. Um, so which is a you know, blessing and a curse all at the same time. Uh, previously, I was at Oakville School of the Holy Child in Summit, New Jersey, which is a uh, uh, co-ed and same-sex school uh, for about 500 students. Oh, sorry. North Broward is about 1,700 students. We have international boarding um, and we're pre-K through 12. Uh, we're also an Apple Distinguished School and we have one-to-one -one everywhere. So uh, and same thing at Oak Knoll, we were one-to-one -one everywhere. Uh, and then prior to that, I was at Rutgers University. So I've been around for a while. Um, the other thing from the, just from the announcement that I always have to plug, and Sarah knows this, I'm also a certified educational technology leader from COSIN, which is a, a certification for people who sit in my role to sort of be the certification that we can work in both the academic and the operational IT side. So it's the, I've been a trainer for that as well for a number of years. So come at it from a, from a very different perspective, so. Thank you, and thank you for adding that detail as well. That's important. Um, I just wanna remind everybody, if you've got questions for Alex, please put them in the Q&A and absolutely use the chat to share resources and connect with others in the webinar. So Alex, with your, um, extensive experience getting to know your school for six months. Tell me <laughs> how the past year went when the, um, when the first shutdown came and then when you went back, all of the details, please. Sure. So we actually, um, because we were an international school and we had a significant population that was coming from China, we were aware of this probably before Christmas. Um, we started a little bit earlier than most people. We actually had our first, for our uh, residential facility, we actually had our first isolation cases in February because we had students that had left to go home for the Lunar New Year and then had returned to campus. 
Um, and while everyone is still fig everybody was figuring it out, we were actually piloting. Um, and it seems ironic now, we were doing that first pilot test case with those students who were in our residential facilities of distance learning because they were in our in our dorms and we were using at that point Google Meets to just have them attend class. We weren't doing anything too spectacular, too fancy, but like I started in the introduction, we are an Apple distinguished school. We have iPads for every student. We have Canvas as a learning management system. We do everything digitally. We did everything digitally from the start. So we were, I wanna say primed for the, the pivot that needed to come. So we, we spent that February and into that spring break in March testing what we thought we needed, um, trying out meets and different pieces. Um, we settled on really adding what I'd consider a very small tool set to our toolkit. We added Zoom, Edpuzzle, and an official license for Padlet and Seesaw at the time because we didn't have our um, pre-K through five integrated fully into Canvas yet. So we created Seesaw for them to do interactions. We did, uh, everybody else was in Canvas. We did, we left for spring break with the, without the knowledge of whether we would come back or not. Our first day back from spring break, we closed to students and opened for faculty. We taught Zoom. And the next day we were live on Zoom with students. Again, the, the advantage, we were prepared. Students always checked into Canvas for information about their class. Students always knew that their homework was posted there. So it was a little bit of training for our lower school parents to know to go to Seesaw. And that took a little bit of a transition. But classes were held on Zoom and Seesaw. We changed our academic schedule to map out what we wanted to do. And then, you know, we polled, constantly, constantly polled our parents, our faculty, and our students for what was working and what wasn't. And that got us to planning for the summer where we revamped and had a more stringent academic academic schedule and then went from all virtual to a stage approach where our youngest have been on campus the longest we have had and we have had a hybrid program where students have worked in cohorts and we have had students back on campus five days since january so we've kind of done it all and done it at different phases for the for the process Nice. I want to just take a minute and you said a couple of things I want to explore a little bit more and, you know, full disclosure, I just tweeted it out and I use the word unconscionable and I will stand behind it that if a student who has seven teachers has to go to seven different places to generate the day's to-do list, it's just wrong. And so I would love to know if you want to tell me, Sarah, back off or yes, it made a difference. No, I, I think it's one of the, for us, I believe, still believe that's one of our saving graces. Uh, one of the things that we found and has been, we've been, you know, complimented on by our parents was they knew where to go. For, for our middle and high school, there was no question about where the information for the students was going to be because we had a learning management system and because we had one. If you had two kids, if you had lower our, our lower school and an upper school, you did have two, but that's because the teachers were doing all their classroom interactions through actual seesaw activities. So there was, a again, a di little bit of a different platform, but we did trainings for everyone um, over that first month to get people adjusted. And if you think back, and it's hard to think about that it's a year ago, seems like so much longer, but that was when almost everybody was home. So we were training parents on how to assist their youngest kids to work through. And we had a much, I'll call it a much lighter schedule in terms of how many times we met. Um, and so the kids had, could do things asynchronously as well as with the teacher in class. But that was, that, that I think you're, you're absolutely right. You have to have single places to go. I mean, again, for us, it was two only because of the divisions and the groupings, but a high school student absolutely should not have to go seven places. Like since they're doing it on their own, seven places is way, really two is too much, but you could get away with it if you had to for short periods of time. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you. I was going to say anyway, but um, it's nice to, to hear that. So we've got a quick question. You mentioned trainings for everyone. So can you talk about um, how did you train students? Did you work with their teachers and then they trained 
their students or how did that work out? We, we did a whole, mostly a train the trainer thing. We have a, a somewhat rigorous onboarding process where students that are coming in get training from us on their device and, and the basics. And then in both sixth and ninth grade, which are our entry points. And if you're coming in at a different grade level, you, you're at, you're, you get lumped in with that group for the training, but you go through and our, again, being one-to-one, -one, our teachers are using their iPads almost every day for a lot of the work that they're doing. All the book, we went full digital on books. Everything was, except for some workbooks, everything's on your iPad. So it was, we, we make sure the teachers know how to access the books. We do video recordings and put it up in Canvas in learning areas and the teachers walk the students through and then we can walk the students through as well if there's somebody who's off sequence or missed a day and we held extra sessions as we needed. So it was very much a, again, we, we figured out Zoom, we did all the pieces, we put out worksheets for the, here's your tips, here's your 10 tips of what you need to do. The default settings, we changed them and, and adjusted them as quickly as we needed as things happen, like for Zoom bombing, um, making sure we did all the right settings and that kind of stuff. So we try to do the, the control on the back end for the generic stuff and then encourage teachers to do the experimentation. Um, we had some teachers that had already been using things like Edpuzzle and they adapted it. You know, a lot more teachers grabbed onto it very quickly because they were able to go peer to peer and show how exactly how they were using it much more than just me saying, this is how you take a video, just throw some questions in. It was teachers were sharing with each other. This is how I'm using it to judge these skills, mm -hmm. which then helped the, help the other teachers say, okay, so you're using it for that type of skill. I can do the same thing in my classroom. So science was able to help math, math was able to help English. You know, you're able to go through and, and create, we had those cohorts already as part of our, our you know, infrastructure. Yeah, so, so anybody who's um, come to a few of these webinars before knows that transfer is kind of one of my gold standards and this notion of adaptive expertise, taking what you know, combining it with new information or new methodologies and putting it all together. And it sounds like not only did your tech team get to demonstrate a lot of adaptive expertise, but so did the teachers. Yeah, one of the, the best things for us is that as we started to do the adjustments from the end of last spring into the summer, um, we had teacher cohorts that started coming together to figure out what they needed to do to come back to a hybrid classroom. And they did their own experimentation and training in conjunction with us. So we had, we had groups of teachers that said, okay, if this is what I'm going to have in my classroom, this is the way it's going to be. I can get away. I can do these three things, or I can use, I need this equipment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to say like, we didn't spend a lot on new hardware to, to, to adjust to this. Again, our teachers to start with, our teachers had their own MacBook, their own iPad. Um, all the students had an iPad. We were doing social distancing. We've got Apple TVs and projectors in every classroom. So we literally added, as I was teasing, like I, I bought boxes of these. These are little USB microphones. That was it. Every teacher got a microphone and the microphone, and we tested the microphones and that picked up everything we needed in the classroom and we were good to go. And we started hybrid that way. And not an endorsement of any particular product. Right. <laughs> Anything right. else? Alex is yeah. not getting it. Yeah, I'm not getting anything for this. This was, <laughs> this was, and 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 if you remember, last summer it was very hard to get any type of AV equipment. So oh. it was, it was, you know, it really was find the one you can get and go with it. Right. I have a running joke that it, you know, all the owl salespeople are on an island in Tahiti somewhere. <laughs> um, so. So that's kind of what worked. Is there anything else you mentioned to me when we were prepping for this, um, that the teachers who were relationship builders? Oh yeah, sure. I think one of the things, and this is something that I've had been a firm believer of um, since this whole thing started, is that it's the, the, the technology is all about just the delivery mechanism. Like I've, I've had arguments and discussions with the people who said, our curriculum have changed. Uh, no you're still teaching the same thing. The mechanism by which you're delivering it is no longer face-to-face. -face. It's no longer, you're still teaching the same things. It's just how you're teaching them is, is very different. And I'm a firm believer of it's the, the teachers who know how to build relationships in their classrooms. They won, I said this, but they won the pandemic. 
Like they still built their classrooms. They, their kids are the ones, if you go around your school, those teachers are the ones that really have engaged with their kids. And those kids are the ones that keep their cameras on in class and do the, and, and are engaging and still doing well. And it's, again, it's, I don't want to say the cult of personality, but that skill set, that being able to pull the students out of themselves to engage with the teacher as well as the material. Because if you're just standing in front of the class, if, if your job was standing in front of the classroom and lecturing and pointing at the whiteboard behind you, sitting at your laptop, pointing at your PowerPoint, still that wasn't good teaching back then. And it's not good teaching now but bringing the students in, drawing them in via something that was interactive or the new discussion that you're gonna have or the way you're gonna to have to do your experiment now and being honest and upfront and engaging them, that made that makes the difference. I can see it in, in people I've talked to at other schools. I can see it in my teachers. Um, it's that engagement is what we should be about, not the technology. The technology is just there to help. So, thank you. Love that. Um, so, all right. So these are some things that really worked. Was there anything that just let you down? Did anything disappoint you? Um, a lot more of the, I want to say it again, say it's systemat systems type stuff. Um, it, you know, everybody got busy and then it became difficult to just get things done. Um, it became difficult to find stuff. And then it's, the thing that still gets me is the, is the, I don't know, we're all doing a lot. We're all doing more than we've ever done before, but we need to remember, like, it's still about not us. Like it's the kids' lives that are being changed much more than ours. And I still think the as much as I want people to be safe, as much as I want people to, to know that they're in safe environments, the, the, the callous, I want to say callousness, it's from some people, both students and teachers about what is really going on in the sort of in the in the world. Like this is we're just sort of a, a side effect and symptom of of something that's much, much bigger. Um, and remembering that part, like that's that's been my sort of disappointment in the we sometimes, you know, I even admit myself gotten too petty about what the different change or the different thing we need to do and get frustrated a lot quicker. Again, we're all dealing with stresses that we've never had to deal with before. But I think that's the losing losing track of what we're really supposed to be about and, and being able to recover is really the thing that I think has been the biggest challenge and the hardest part to, to keep focused on. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that's super important. We had, um... Tom Rashawn from ERB on a few weeks ago, and we had a conversation about the difference between what the headlines keep saying learning loss and what he was trying to say is a, a change in growth and a slow in the growth that standardized testing can measure. But then we talked about what are the other ways that kids are growing? You know, if you've got a 16 year old boy who is suddenly responsible for our two younger siblings and two young cousins all day, every day. And they're all under 10 years old. That, that child has grown a lot. <laughs> that, that, that child has absolutely grown a lot. I, I mean, I can look at, at some of the things, my own, um, my eldest is a middle is in middle school. And since we've done this, it's and in, in the last year, she has learned cooking, grilling, sewing, knitting, um, playing an additional instrument, as well as, you know, typical geeky things from her father, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and, and other things. But there are skills that she would not have gotten to do without some of the, I'll call it freedom from classes, because there was just so much time. Um, and you want to fill it with something positive, but also the ability to explore interests because they're not the, the wasted time in the school day. I think we'd all admit that there is time that could be better used if they if you had it available to you um and we've had we've had some feedback from our own students that they're recognizing how much time they waste in a regular school day doing things that are not related to their learning that they're doing on their own that it's not when they're you know in between classes and doing this at home they would do three other things and here they kind of just meander into classes the bell rings you know <laughs> after dragging their feet going across campus it's it's a very different 
You know, it's a very different mindset of what they do. I don't think there's been, there's been a loss potentially in test scores. There's been a loss potentially in some of those measurements, but I don't think there's been a learning loss. You know, and I like the way you pointed out how students' time is used because I think one of the things that an intentional leader needs to do right now is think about some of the ways that we were occupying kids' time that was more valuable than we knew. And then maybe there are some ways that we were keeping kids busy that wasn't necessarily fostering the kind of growth that we want to see. And I think those are questions to have. Probably not right now, but this summer. And yeah, looking I mean, next year, the scheduling group has been talking about thinking about student time. Yeah. And one of the things that we, you know, being on the tech side, I'm responsible for all of our robotics and competitive teams that do all the other things. The our biggest challenge has been that lost time in the lab to experiment. Like that's where, you know, I can't replicate a lab full of machine equipment and parts for a robot in everyone's house. I can do kits to build certain things and achieve certain learning goals, but I can't allow for that. You have to be in the lab to do experimentation, like to be able to play with stuff and does this work? How do I learn this? And we, like our, my teachers and my, my team leaders are, we are counting down the days till we can really get the full teams back in the lab and actually have that interaction from the students. Like that, this dropping in between classes to check on something that was running or to see if, you know, a part came in. We see that, like that, that part's missing. And we think that's good. That's really the, the, the piece that we mourn the most of those, those, that interaction and that ability for students. Right. And, you know, um, we used to call that tinkering. I don't know, sometimes terms come and go, but that sort of messing around yep. ability. Uh, one of the things that has disappointed me, and um, if you saw the blog, you know that I am a fan of Ready Player One. I like science fiction, the book, not the movie. The movie's okay. The book was great. Um, so VR let us down. And I just did a demo and I won't say who, because um, it really disappointed me. It was the idea of how we could have meeting spaces in virtual reality and invite people in. And I think just to get through the demo, the amount of training that I needed, I think if a participant is going to be in a technology that is supposed to mimic another environment and the participant needs that much training is DOA, right? It's gotta, it's gotta just feel like you're walking in and it works. Yeah, especially on, on anything that's going to mimic reality. I mean, it's different if we say, okay, I need you to design something. Here's how you go about it. Or right. I need you to, but if I want you to interact, the barrier has to be minimal. I think that's, again, and that's where it comes down to the technology, while it might be able to quote unquote, visually replace us being in the same room with each other, it's that interpersonal dynamic. If it's that hard for me to figure out how to manipulate the environment, then I can't be me. Like as, as I'm just realizing now, I am fully talking with my hands as if Sarah and I were sitting across from each other and she and we've done this and she knows that this is, this is me. Zoom is not affecting my ability to communicate right now. That is, that's a great analogy. And then we've got one question in Q&A that we'll get to in a minute, but I wanna ask you, uh, about, I quoted you in my blog because of something you said during an ed tech chat <laughs> that I have been thinking about ever since, which is you said there's been a lot of S in our use of technology. And then I ruminated on that a lot because I think tech has the potential to be our R&D and our frontier. Like, how do we think about what's coming next? Yeah, actually, that's I, and thinking it? back in the things that the things that have let me down. This is the biggest from a, a global scale. Um, when the pandemic hit, it was, okay, we've got to replicate the classroom. And we've done, a, if you're familiar with the SAMR model, which is the substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition, we, yeah, we all went straight to substitution because in some cases we had to, we had to replace, we had to do this. We had to do the, this video for being able to have the teacher talk to the students. So there had to be some base substitution. But I think our biggest challenge is, you know, so when we go back and we'll go back in face-to-face -face eventually, so that substitution won't be necessary anymore. 
But the real challenge in technology is getting beyond that substitution phase. It's about using the technology to change what they're doing, what you're doing. So we di- we all did a lot of initially. Okay, we have a paper worksheet. It's scanned in. Now it's digital. Now do it on the do it on whatever device. We had a, a you know a multiple choice test. We now put it in whatever test platform or learning management system we have you know, Kahoot, Quizlet, whatever, it's now a quiz that we do the exact same thing. So we've just transferred the way we do things. And we haven't always taken the opportunity to do that transformational level, the things that will give us better feedback on how the students are learning, or give us, give the students the opportunity to really engage with the material, to really say, okay, does your, does your project need to be, you know, the standard poster board, you know, trifold that sits up there with some pictures cut out and everything else, or does it even still have to be a website? Can I do a video? Can I do uh, a, my five minute TED, TED talk on what I'm supposed to be presenting for my history class? Can I do, can I put those things together so that I'm now moving away from this? Well, there's still a rubric and there's still think we're still measuring what they're learning, but it's not about the checking off of boxes. And moving away from that just simple, okay, I give you information, you give it back to me. How do we, the technology is here to make that one easier, but two, to change how we do it, to give us the ability to increase the flexibility and creativity of what the students give us. And if that's where I think we still need to push ourselves, especially as we look to go back. Like I'm, I'm imploring all my teachers, what are the things as we look to go back to full-time face-to-face that you're keeping in your classroom that you l- use during the pandemic. And if there's nothing, then I'm really gonna be working with them to say, well, what, what, were you, what were we doing? You know, I have some teachers that have changed some of their assignments and some of the work that they're doing and made things much more interactive. And some of that's gonna stay because we're just gonna change how the interaction works. Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, if you sat and lectured at your PowerPoint the whole time, we, there's probably a lot of, we still need to do some work on getting the technology better integrated and potentially, you know, some real teaching methodologies as well. Great. Thank you. So I do want to make sure that I get um, Sarah, not me, Sarah's question. <laughs> and so Sarah asked, um, they did away with Edpuzzle at their school because Canvas Studio had similar capabilities. So just wondering about you keeping both of those. So we, we, we don't have the Canvas Studio piece. So we're, we um, st- stuck with, stayed with Edpuzzle. Um, if you have the resources and the ability to go the full Canvas suite, there's no reason to not use the Canvas tool. There isn't anything additional or special to me about Edpuzzle that makes it different than what you can do in Canvas Studio. It's, it's about, again, the right tool for your teachers and the environment. Um, at this point, I, we were, we've been challenged with, we were moving to a new student information system as the pandemic hit. So I've been training on an entirely new uh, grading platform, attendance platform and backend platform for report cards, GPAs and everything else. We were trying not to add to our, our software load for our teachers to have them focus on, again, we were focusing on trying to take the tools we have and now increase how we're using them so that we weren't, you know, we needed to do a little bit of fill in, which is where the Edpuzzle Padlet came in. But, and we're sticking with those now for the, for the next year or so um, before we try and make an, addi- an additional change. What we're gonna focus on now is dropping out all the tools that we've had kind of lying around for a while that are, you know, cluttering up the iPad interface and dropping out apps that we don't need or things that people realize that, you know, I don't really use this as often as I, as I wanted. Right. I, I call that the sushi knife set approach to toolkits rather than the pegboard with everything that you can think of. Yeah. You know, the more things a tool will do and the more generalized it is, the better off you can use it. Absolutely. Well, Alex, we're at 1230 and I promised you we would be right on time because you are headed into a classroom. So yes. thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you I'll everyone just, for coming. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon.